Hi, everybody. I'm Al Rochelle, and welcome back. And we're going to be talking in this segment about POTS and the coexisting disorders that could occur with it. Joining us right now is Dr. Amanda Peltier. Doctor, thank you so much for coming by. Thank you for inviting me. All right, so let's start out our conversation by telling me a little bit about yourself and the work that you're involved in, kind of like your bio, if you would. Okay. Well, so I'm a neurologist who does both autonomic and peripheral nerve disorders. So I started out training in neuromuscular disorders at the University of Michigan. Mm-hmm. Um, I had a little problem because I actually did my medical school training at Ohio State, and then my family called me a traitor after I did my <laughs> residency and matched at University of Michigan, uh, but uh, did a three-year fellowship there, uh, in which included a master's in clinical research design and statistical analysis. And then um, during that fellowship, I was actually learned about testing for autonomic disorders and looking at autonomic tests in diabetics is where I started out, you know, learning about autonomic disorders. And we were at the time looking at patients with pre-diabetes, so patients who did not have outright diabetes, but had, um, you know, high cholesterol, higher range glucoses, and um, and the fact that they could have abnormal autonomic testing and abnormal, you know, testing in their nerves, and could that be a potential cause of, you know, neuropathy. And so, uh, so I did projects on that during my fellowship and then when I was came time to look for a real job uh, David Robertson who was the head of the autonomic group at Vanderbilt okay. you know uh, mm-hmm. helped rec- in my chair in neurology helped recruit me to Vanderbilt and so that was back in 2005 and I've been at Vanderbilt ever since and so uh, and it's been a great uh, time because we have a very multidisciplinary group at Vanderbilt so the autonomic group was started by David Robertson who's a clinical pharmacologist. Okay. So he yeah. was interested in blood pressure and in looking at, you know, basically um, low blood pressure as opposed to, you know, most people were looking at high blood pressure at the time. And so he was interested both in orthostatic hypotension and also POTS. And he developed a huge group and recruited a lot of people, including Dr. Biagioni, Dr. Shabao, Dr. Raj. Um, and so a lot of people trained at uh, um, Vanderbilt, and he also collaborated with a lot of people across the world. So mm-hmm. he has a big collaboration group with uh, scientists from Germany, Italy, et cetera. Wow. So yeah, so, and they also did a lot of work like with the astronauts from the space station and doing anti-gravity work. Oh, um, that's so they've done a whole bunch of interesting things. So let's, know, let's, so let's get back to the POTS. How, did, how does POTS tie into all these things? Because are there some other underlying conditions that occur as a result of POTS or come along with POTS? Not that POTS may cause it, but, but whatever. So, I mean, they saw a lot of POTS patients over the years, you know, who referred to the anomic group. And it was David who really... Um, Kind of would like to tell people about the fact that this is not a new syndrome. It's been going on for you know hundreds of years and has gone by different uh, monikers over time. Oh. So back in World War One, it was called Soldier's Heart because um, the World War One soldiers would develop the same syndrome. You know when they came back from the war oh, um, in the 1880s. You know women with it were call, you know told they had neurasthenia. And you know, um, and you know, so and then in my generation, it was called mitral valve, mitral valve prolapse, prolapse, which I had heard of. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah and then and then Phil Lowe coined the phrase POTS, um, and it's a helpful phrase, but in some ways, it's not very helpful because the POTS only talks about the high heart rate, and so the problem with it is it kind of excludes all the other stuff that comes with that. You oh, know, gosh. syndrome. Yeah, yeah. You know, because most of the patients that we see have more symptoms than just the high heart rate and lightheadedness. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so but uh, um, so that was kind of the moniker that stuck probably the longest. Right. You know, and then but then the issue is is that it's a syndrome. So the problem with a syndrome is it's a collection of symptoms and signs, but there can be many different causes. So like our group. Um, you know, has you know looked at a whole bunch of different um, causes, and they've identified patients who presented with POTS who ended up having mast cell activation syndrome, patients mm-hmm. who've had uh, genetic syndromes, um, different autoantibodies, and so they have looked for different things over the years, um, and. Uh, and it's helpful in some ways, but it's also in some ways can be somewhat challenging because it's. Uh, you know, looking for the individual cause is um, 
is hard when there's you know hundreds of possible different but, causes. But you almost, and we know that, that being a doctor oftentimes involves a checklist of things that you eliminate first as you go down there, and because there are so many things that you can't eliminate or are not sure. So in some of these other deficiencies, then, then where are we right now? Do you have to do all of these tests uh, for an individual that has POTS then to figure out which of those subgroups it might be? Well, you have to, you know, talk to the patient and listen to their symptoms because, for example, not every patient is going to have significant flushing and, um, you know, signs of mast cell, for example. Right. Or not everybody is going to have dry mouth and dry eyes and sicka syndrome or neuropathy, for example. So, mm -hmm. so it really goes back to kind of old school medicine where you actually talk to the patient right. and well, listen yeah, to them. Yeah. <laughs> and then, you know, and then test for the things that make sense. Um, and, you know, and you can always add tests later on, but, you know, you're trying to strike that balance of not over-testing, because the problem with over-testing is that, you know, you know, just by chance alone, you're going to find something abnormal. And then oh, the question true. is, are yeah. you going to chase it down the rabbit hole and cost the patient a lot of time, effort, and money, you know, testing for stuff that really doesn't make any sense or doesn't really fit well with what they're So since you've been doing this for a long time, have you, have you seen progress or to the point where you can say, okay, now, reasonably speaking, these are the tests that we should be concentrating on rather than having to do what I call the shotgun approach, which is you point a shotgun and the pellets fly all over and you, you try to grab each one of the pellets and, and you'll be chasing pellets the rest of your life. Right. Well, I think we all agree on a kind of a nucleus of tests. And then I think, you know, beyond that, then it's determined by the patient. Mm -hmm. You know, so all of us will test for thyroid. That's a given, um, especially since it's so common. Um, and, you know, all of us will test for B12 generally because B12 deficiency has been linked, especially in kids with POTS. And, it's, and I found it, you know, deficiency in, in women with POTS. Mm -hmm. And it's easily treatable disorder, so you never want to miss it. And it's cheap to fix because B12 is really cheap. Yeah. You know, yeah. so, um, and then all of us generally will check iron levels and make sure people aren't anemic. Um, and then most of us now, I think, do test for, you know, Sjogren's especially because it's such a common uh, overlap uh, with POTS. I mean, then beyond that, that's when I think you Tell start Tell me about Sjogren's. Not, that's the only term I'm not familiar with. What's that? Sjogren's syndrome and Sika yeah. syndrome. Okay. So, so Sika is just a dry eyes, dry mouth complex of symptoms. And right. then in Sjogren's, they have autoantibodies, and, uh, which are only present about 50% of the time. And what's interesting about Sjogren's is that it's also associated with a lot of other neurologic disorders. Mm -hmm. So there's a certain percentage of patients will have a non-link dependent neuropathy. And when I say non-link dependent, it means it can be patchy and they can have symptoms kind of in random spots as opposed to primarily in their feet and their hands. So when you talk about these coexisting uh, disorders that occur, do you test for the coexisting disorder specifically or do you test for any group of coexisting conditions? Just specifically the coexisting just specifically. disorders. And we're seeing progress in that, right? Yes. But the problem is, is, though, it still doesn't explain, you know, a good portion of patients. And then some things that are coexisting, um, like Ehlers-Danlos, we don't understand, actually, because, well, one, there's no genetic test or physical test. There's, it's really a symptom score of, you know, the Brighton criteria, basically how hyper-flexible are you, yeah. and they look at different joints and look at, you know, whether or not, uh, you know, if you can push your fingers back to a certain degree or push your elbow back, yeah, you know. Yeah. You know, and so... And then the more familiar things like chronic fatigue syndrome. Right. I mean, when everybody well, talked about that. chronic fatigue syndrome, again, oh. is another syndrome. Right. And again, it's one of those issues where you have to rule out a whole lot of different things. Wow. And sometimes, in, in just like with POTS, you're left with this kind of idiopathic group where you can't find anything else that explains it, but they're still having a lot of symptoms, and then you're stuck with just treating the symptoms. Oh, gosh. So we are hoping that these videos will be watched by patients and also by physicians. So let's take it from a physician standpoint. If there's one thing you could tell a doctor or a healthcare worker that's watching this video right now about this, what would it be? Um, I think it's one is that uh, these patients a lot of times can be helped with very simple measures. I think that's the important thing is that a lot of patients, even if they have all these coexisting conditions, still the basics of hydration, salt, and exercise are probably the most helpful things that any patient does. You know, sure. you can add plus minus beta blockers, you can add plus minus other medicines, but really those three are still kind of the bedrock of treatment. Mm -hmm. And I would say the vast majority of patients still respond to just those 
right. without having to go on to have other treatments. And that's the same message you would actually have for patients that might be watching this as oh, well. Oh, yes. No, Follow I that mean, treatment. And, and many of my patients um, who do, um, you know, are able to exercise and do stuff will find improvement of symptoms. I think the 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 thing that's frustrating to them is that it's a treatment but it's not a cure so right, if they right. stop exercising and they you know they think they're Done. better right yeah and then you yeah. know and, and you know and life happens yeah. i mean it's hard to keep up with exercise oh yeah especially if you're a young things. person too you know that uh, um and you kind of you know slack off yeah. then everything's going to come back well doctor thank you so much for your time and good luck as you continue your research as well all right well thank you so much um,